when we get to the details. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Gresham Technologies PLC investor presentation for the half year results for the six months ending 30th of June 2020. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and they can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of the screen. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available on your Investor Meet Company dashboard. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand over to Ian Manacher and Tom Mullen, CFO of Gresham Technologies. Take care. Thank you, guys. Super, thank you, Mark, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, so I, I'm Ian, and um, delighted to see so many folks logging in to this presentation. Um, so the plan for, did for today, uh, we'll take you through a slide deck. I'll stay on video with, with Tom for, for the start, but when we get into the detail slides, we'll disappear off. Um, we'll see your questions as we go through, and we'll wrap up with further questions at the end. And I hope you find it really interesting and informative. Um, so I guess just to kick off, uh, I mean, clearly the last few months has been um, really quite unprecedented for all of us in the current market. Um, but I'm, I'm pleased to say to you that your company is in good hands. And, and actually, when you look beneath some of the headlines, I think you'll find that we've actually had an outstanding first half. Uh, and I'd really like to explain to you why that is and, um, and then obviously talk a little later on about the strategic opportunity and I'm conscious that some of you will know us very well, uh, and some of you are perhaps less familiar with, uh, with the company. So just in terms of the agenda, I'll say a, f a few words really on progress against the strategic plan, which I think will introduce to you Gresham as a whole. We'll look at the operational highlights for the first six months, uh, and then Tom will look at the financial highlights and do an analysis of those. Uh, and then I'll come back towards the end and talk about the strategic opportunity. And then, of course, what we see as the priorities for the second half of the year. So just taking a step back up uh, and, and thinking about the first half, um, you know, first thing I would say is you know, the company is fit and well. We moved our entire team in all of our 11 offices around the world to remote working um, week of the second week of March. We're operating at full capacity. Um, we've not made any furloughs or any redundancies or cuts as a direct result of uh, COVID. Um, and we're pretty upbeat about where we stand, um, you know, moving forward. Um, the first half we feel has been pretty strong. Um, and you do need to look under the headlines to understand that. Uh, and if I just quickly draw out some highlights for you, um, first of all, uh, over the last few months, we have been signing quite substantial new business. As a subscription business, you don't always see that within the headline numbers. Um, so in the first half of this year, we added 1.2 million to our clarity recurring revenue. And of course, the total contract value of those new orders is substantially higher. Um, a key part of that was a tier one bank win. Um, representing about half of that new business. Um, so the net net of it is forward-looking basis. Our clarity ARR is up 18% year on year, and we're pretty pleased with that. Um, it's also good to see that the non-clarity ARR is also up, and Tom will explain a little bit more about our non-clarity portfolio as we go through. So all in all, the business model um, is proving pretty resilient. And, and a key reason for that was the strategic move that we made about two years ago now to focus much more heavily on recurring revenue. And you'll see, in fact, some figures later on that show our clarity recurring revenue now represent, um, you know, 80% of that clarity revenue is now recurring revenue, subscription based revenue rather. Um, so all in all, a very positive first half for us. Um, and it's really important that when we look at those numbers, that the comparatives versus the first half of 19 are put into context and also first half versus second half timing and phasing is put into context. So we'll try and explain that 
um, as we go through. So just moving on to, to look at the group strategic plan, and, and this really is where we put some context around where clarity fits in versus the rest of our business. If we look back um, over the last um, eight years or so, from, a, from the point in time where our non-clarity business was the business, um, we've clearly been building a new business on top of that, um, on, on top of that legacy, which was, which was a mixed portfolio of our own IP, systems integration, reselling and contracting. Um, and that business, the grey bars there, have remarkably held up well, um, but actually the change in mix in there has been quite key. And it's actually important to appreciate that some 3 million of profits have dropped away in that legacy business over the period. And clearly our challenge has been to build a new business on top of that, um, that will get to a point where it's standalone and cash profitable. And we are very close to that. Indeed, we're on track with our plan to do that. And Tom will touch on that a little later on. Um, so COVID-19 wise, new wins have been a little slower than planned but nothing that concerns us in terms of our strategic plan. And our renewals, our services on the Clarity side have been very robust. In fact, we've added a million pounds worth of new services orders in the first half uh, on Clarity. Uh, and as I said, our non-Clarity is all proving pretty resilient. So I think at that point, um, as we now dive into the detailed slides, we'll maximize the slides and you'll see us again on video later on. So just coming on to operational highlights, um, as I mentioned, from a business continuity perspective, um, I'm really proud of how the Gresham team has uh, made that adjustment. Um, we haven't skipped a beat in terms of our key project work. Um, and the market that we face off to and support, largely capital markets clients, you know, have been handling massive trading volumes um, and very high levels of exceptions and breaks in their business, which has stressed our software um, because essentially that's what we do for them. We help them manage those breaks and we help them manage their post-trade operations. And our software has performed incredibly well. Um, so you'll see our customer service um, figures, our SLA and our customer satisfaction figures in our report. And very, very pleased that Probably in our most challenging quarter, we've turned out some outstanding figures in terms of our support for customers, uh, which, of course, is the bedrock of a good company. Um, from a sales and marketing perspective, as I've already touched on, we've signed a new tier one bank client. Um, and as you'll see in the slides a little later on, key customers for us are very important. You know, once we open up a major tier one bank relationship or tier one sell side, uh, ba uh, sorry, buy side relationship, we're confident we can do a great job. We're confident we can deliver great business value and we're confident they will grow the relationship. So to bring on a new key customer in during the COVID period is really, really outstanding. We've also... Um, hit the second milestone during the quarter in terms of our ANZ uh, relationship where we're working with them, as we've announced some 18 months ago, to build out some new um, Clarity products. Um, and we've hit the right milestones as expected. Um, and then they've moved that new product into testing. Um, and as a result, have felt confident to step up their licensing commitment with us. Um, so, again, that contributes to our forward-looking revenue, um, which, which factors into that 18% growth number that we've talked about. In general, through the last quarter, we've had to move our sales and marketing team to work and condition, uh, continue their work remotely. We've transitioned our marketing activity to be heavily digital. Um, and, of course, we've been also building out our team. And I'll touch a little bit on that um, a little later on, um, but we've onboarded new people in the sales function and we've onboarded new folks in the marketing team. We've done that successfully remotely and been very pleased with the talent that we brought into the company. 
From a technology perspective, we've continued our R&D program, um, again, without missing a beat. Um, our core work on CTC, our flagship product, um, we've been extending that product to build out cash and securities processing functionality. Um, and that's now in production use um, with our first clients. So we're pleased on that. And I'll say a few more words on that. Um, and we've also made good progress with uh, our multibank product. And we've also made some good progress with our cloud offerings. And just on cloud, I'll say a word on that because you may have spotted that we made an announcement of a new key executive appointment around cloud. One of the key differentiators for our technology versus the competition is that we don't mind whether the customer wants to deploy our technology on premise or in the cloud. And indeed, we don't mind whether they want to deploy it in their private cloud, in the Amazon public cloud, in the Azure public cloud, or indeed in a private cloud that we run and operate for them. Um, and that flexibility um, is really important and a key differentiator for us. Also in the first half, from a customer success perspective, I'm really pleased to say that the two big tier one bank wins that we announced in the first half of 2019 um, those implementation projects have gone extremely well. And I know that looking at the questions, one of you has asked specifically about one of those tier one banks. Uh, so I'm pleased to say that um, in June, we went live with the first of those tier one banks for a key part of their cash and stock processing. Um, and those projects continue through this year as we complete those projects and they move the rest of their processing onto CTC. Um, and those are flagship wins. The entire industry is looking at those projects. Um, and for us, they, um, they're going very well and are proving to be great references in the market. Um, so our services business as a result of those projects and others has performed pretty well, actually. And you'll see from the numbers that year on year, our services there or thereabouts the same level of revenues. And Tom will, will talk to that point. So I think in, in summary, operationally for the first half, it's been, um, as a management challenge, a pretty tough first half. You won't be surprised to hear that. Um, but actually, in terms of service to customers, in terms of winning new business, and in delivering on our promise to customers, I'm very pleased with where we stand. And I'm also very pleased that based upon our strong recurring revenue that we've built up over the last couple of years, that we've got confidence uh, you know, as we enter the second half that our currently contracted revenues, both recurring revenues and our um, you know, our legacy business that we already have extremely high visibility of, that we come out of the first half with 88% um, revenue for our full year original uh, forecast, cut well covered. Uh, and actually off the back of that, we have a very high degree of comfort that our original full year group earnings is already well covered. Um, so, Tom, let's move now on to the financial highlights. Um, and I'll leave you to dive into uh, the rest of those, if I may. Sure. Thank you, Ian. So I think the, the key thing for us to think about and, and be aware of when we're looking at the, the, the revenues, both for the group and for Clarity specifically, is the, the the longer term trends need to be taken into account as opposed to just looking at the first half of 2019 and first half of, of 2020. Um, you will remember that uh, for those of you who have uh, who we've spoken to before, that, that probably about 18 months ago, um, we, we um, started talking uh, ab about a couple of cancellations that, that occurred. Um, one came off the back of the cessation of our uh, joint venture with Mount Street. 
um, which ended on the on the 30th of June 2019 and generated recurring revenues for the full period of the pro first half of the prior year. Similarly, with a uh, Clarity Multibank customer um, that uh, a Scandinavian bank had deployed the multibank technology for their Luxembourg-based operation, they shut down their operations in Luxembourg, which also uh, took, it, took effect from the 30th of June 2019, generating a full, full half of revenues from those customers in the previous year that we don't don't have in this year. That at a, at a group level, sorry, at a clarity uh, entire revenues as, as well, we also need to consider the non-recurring revenue that came in the first half of the prior year of approximately 0.6 million um, that was signed uh, under a term license agreement. So there is a renewing element of it but it renews in the sixth year of the contract when an element of that will, will repeat. Um, now, as Ian alluded to earlier, you know, it's aligned with us with our strategic goals that we moved our, our business to a near 100% recurring revenue model. And that was that one I just referred to was it was actually an early adopter who was grandfathered from an old perpetual style license to a term style license and we'd hope to be subscription moving forward. Um, so as, as Ian says, 88% of our planned full year group revenues are either contracted or highly visible. From that, we have uh, very, very high levels of comfort in our ability to be able to, to achieve our, our earnings levels that were expected for, for the full year. Um, but really looking forward, and uh, good, critically so, uh, our clarity forward-looking annual recurring revenues have grown 18% year on year. Of that 18% growth, 13% has come in the last, last six months. And, and that's really the, the, the key figure that gives us significant comfort and predictability in the business that enables us to, uh, to, to maintain levels of cost and, and indeed invest further in the business as we, as we move forward. Just moving on to look at the, uh, the, the, the portfolio of revenues across the group. Now, I'll leave clarity for now um, because we'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. But Ian mentioned the, 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 chain, the, the change in the mix of the non-clarity portfolio. Now, we've always, uh, certainly for the last few years, referred to this business, these lines of business as being in structural decline. Uh, but I'll talk, th talk through them one by one. Software Partners really has two customers remaining in it. What one of those customers is in is in runoff and has been in runoff for a number of years and will continue to to run off over the last six months when we actually expect it, it, it to end. That is offset by another customer um, under the same partnership whose uh, end customers usage and account based fees have been increasing. Um, and, and that's what you see there in those uh, more recent halves coming, uh, ending up with a, in a sort of net increase position, certainly against the, the equivalent half in the, in the prior year, but slightly down upon the immediate preceding half. We expect that line of business to remain relatively flat on a net basis um, for the foreseeable future. Moving on to our software owned solutions. So uh, there is one remaining uh, software product within this, this portfolio. Um, that is uh, a, a tape storage business software around um, uh, intelligent archiving and library, library functions around old tape storage uh, backup data centers. 
Um, for obvious reasons, uh, nobody buys this, this product anymore, but it is still in use in a number of large institutions around the world, and we continue to support and maintain it. Um, we do expect this, this business to run off. However, not in the, in the near future, our customers typically sign, in fact, all of our customers sign um, annually, annual commitments to this. So we have good visibility over it over at least the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and we expect the, the, the trend over the most recent halves to continue. Uh, as a reminder to, to you all, the, the, the slightly larger step down in that line of business at the start of 2019 was a result of the sale of our uh, VME business to Fujitsu. The services contracting business, this is one customer. This is one customer who, where we provide uh, augmentation to their own internal IT infrastructure and resourcing. Um, this customer pays us a fixed margin of 13%, as, as shown there on the, on the slide, um, and signs SOWs a year in advance. Drawdown on that SOW does vary a little bit, period upon period. However, we typically have very good visibility six to 12 months in advance and expect that to remain relatively flat for the next six to 12 months. So now moving on just to have a look at the clarity uh, revenues in particular um, on, on slide, slide eight. Um, Clarity Software recurring revenues and compound annual growth rates is, is 45% over the five years. And uh, we're, we're certainly pleased with that, that, that historically. Um, you can see in this slide the successful transition we've made to annually recurring revenues, as opposed to the earlier days of Clarity, where there was originally some perpetual licenses signed for our early adopters. And in more recent years, term licenses where there is a recurring element, but not, not necessarily annually. You can equally see the general upward trend of those recurring revenues. Um, and you can clearly see the slight spike in, in the first half of the prior year, so 2019 half one, that I mentioned earlier that benefited from, benefited from some of those contracts that were in runoff during that period. Uh, Ian mentioned our services revenues, Clarity services re revenues remaining relatively flat. We expect them to continue to remain relatively flat. Th this is services to, um, to, to help our customers become successful in implementing and onboarding our software. And we expect that to, to remain around the, the, the same sort of levels as it has been over the past four periods. Equally on services, you know, we've got a good order book and strong visibility of it for the rest of the year. And you know, we're, it's very pleasing to see, and again, Ian mentioned earlier, that our move to remote working um, uh, has had a relatively negligible, excuse me, negligible impact uh, since since the move to remote working has occurred. To move on to slide nine and have a look at our Clarity annualized recurring revenues. Now, to be clear over what this is showing, this is showing our our contracted Clarity software revenues that are under contract, uh, and we and we expect, or in fact contracted, to recognize over the next 12 months. This does not include any um, contracted step-ups in revenue where we are still yet to deliver something, that, something in the future, as is the case for some of our, our, our contracts. So this is purely what we have delivered, and from what we have delivered, what is recognizable, in the next in the next twelve months, at, in the most recent bar, at the, the most recent half year point, you can see that we've increased that from the thirty first of December two thousand nineteen position by one point two million. You can see the, the the positive impact of the small bolt on acquisitions that we made in in recent years, 
um, and we we are looking to to, to grow, um, clearly grow that and, and add to that moving forward. Um, and this will be a key metric for us to look at um, look at at the full year as it will drive some of our investment decisions from there. Um, on the right hand side of this this slide, you'll see the mix in our in our go to market initiatives. So between data integrity and control, that was the original sort of core use case for Clarity. Cash management and, and payments uh, that uh, some of well, some of the acquisitions have, have benefited from has, has driven that number. And in addition to that, some of the initiatives with um, with, with ANZ have also uh, caused an increase in in that segment. Um, our regulatory segment is more in its infancy, but is continuing to grow. Regionally, the split hasn't hasn't changed significantly from the prior period. Um, you can see the, the significant portion of our revenues continue to come from the UK. I would add that included within that UK number are some, um, are some global deals for some companies that use the software outside of the UK to cover, cover some of their global operations. Um, but you will also see there that our, our North American business is a, is, is a, um, a significant portion and is certainly something that presents significant opportunity for the future. Final pie chart there, just showing, in fact, it doesn't show on this chart, but if you look back to previous charts, you will see the increase in, uh, in portion of those recurring revenues coming from uh, pure subscription uh, software licenses, as opposed to the maintenance and support portions of old perpetual licenses that we sold or old, older term licenses that we sold. Now, moving on to have a look at our operating costs and investments. Um, Ian will say a few words in a moment on the sales and marketing function in particular, but I will just take you through some of those, uh, some of those other functions there. Now, the first thing to say across all of these functions is that this is the cash spend by function. So the development uh, buckets, for example, includes both capitalized development spend and operational development spend so it is completely agnostic to whether uh, we are able to capitalize or not from an accounting perspective it is also agnostic to ifrs 16 so whether we are able to treat our leases as capital or opex this is all treating them just as cash and uh, and treating them like for like with that within all periods uh, and as the cash spend comes through now, let's talk about development there in particular. You'll see it's relatively flat for the past four periods. And prior to that, the jump is purely coming from the acquisition of the B2 group that became a Clarity Multibank product and the developers acquired during that acquisition. On a like-for-like -like basis, we have kept our gross development spend flat uh, for, for, a, for approximately four years and we intend to continue to do so. The, the portion of, cap, of, of development spend that is and isn't capitalizable has moved around uh, in both directions over previous periods and will continue to do so as we, uh, as we move our agile development team around uh, maintaining and enhancing existing product compared to working on new functions and new features that is typically capitalizable. Customer success and delivery has also, uh, has also remained relatively flat over the previous three periods. Um, we don't have any uh, significant plans to increase this spend further. Um, and we've made previous investments in, in prior years. Um, uh, and, and this also, uh, incurred some increases as a result of the B2 acquisition, as, as was the case with, with the development function. Corporate spend has remained relatively flat uh, for, for, the, for the past past few periods, and we don't intend to, we don't intend to make any significant investments there, and we'll look to make efficiencies where possible. But should you just add by, by some percent, we have not 
cuts costs across anywhere in the business. We have managed costs carefully. We've uh, invested carefully, and we've we, we've made sensible, good business decisions around renewals of our own subscription licenses as a as a customer. Um, as we've looked to to run our business in the most efficient man manner possible. Ian, do you want to say a few words on sales and marketing? Yeah, thanks, Tom. So um, you'll see the sales and marketing um, chart there, and you'll see that it's reduced in spend over the last couple of periods. Um, so those bars are made up of a number of items. Clearly, there's headcount and salary. Um, there's the marketing spend, external um, marketing spend. Um, there's travel and expenses and of a global sales team. And then, of course, there's commissions related to, uh, to, to software wins or services wins. Um, so we were expecting a reduction off the, the back of the H119 blue bar that you can see there, because clearly with those two very large wins at that point, there was a substantial amount of commission due because there was a higher proportion of, of that business was upfront than on a subscription basis. So a, a step down was expected. Um, clearly, in the COVID period, our travel and expenses has dropped away to virtually zero. Um, and on the marketing side, we've during the last few months, we've deliberately not cut marketing spend. In fact, we've repurposed it. So spend on conferences, we've repurposed into digital. Um, so the primary reason why beyond commissions and travel and expenses that you'll see a reduction there it, it is actually largely because we've been making some refreshes in the sales team. Um, and it's important we do that from time to time. So we, we took a decision well over a year ago now to make some changes. Um, and, and in large part, the reduction there is because um, we've, as individuals have exited, it's taken us a little while to find individuals to come on board. And in fact, we've got a couple of new salespeople joining um, in the coming weeks. Uh, so you can expect to see the sales and marketing spend uh, step, up, step back up again, or, or, although clearly not at the level of, of, of the blue bar there. So I think just to wrap up on, you know, the overall um, costs within the business, I think to summarize that, we are holding um, our support functions, our delivery functions, our development functions relatively stable. Um, we've deferred some growth in those areas um, until we see how COVID played out. And in large part, we're comfortable that it's playing out um, as we expected. Um, and on the sales and marketing side, we'll continue to step up investment as we go forward um, through this year. And of course, off the back of a successful year, we'll step that up into 2021. Um, and I would say for us as a business, that remains the primary area that we want to continue to invest in. Thanks, Ian. Let's move on and have a look at earnings and profitability. And again, th this is looking at the cash EBITDA. So this is uh, after the application of cash development spend, so both uh, capitalizable and op operational R&D spend. Um, and also it's after the application of the cash spend on our, on our rental and leasing charges. Um, and, and this slide, if you look back, certainly demonstrates the point that, um, that, that we were making earlier around the change in the mix of the business, particularly in that non-clarity portfolio. And you can see the, the, the jump down from, if I look back all the way to 2017, the second half to the first half of 2018, that was actually the start of the process for one of those software partners, customers, that started their runoff process and is still in their runoff process today, but we actually expect it, that runoff process to complete relatively soon. So you can see, there was a significant loss of, of, of profitability at that stage. Um, you can also see the impact during 2018 as we really transitioned the focus of the clarity business to be more of a subscription business. Um, 
uh, as opposed to though as opposed to having those upfront licenses and of course at the back end of 2018 we did have um, a, a couple of uh, significant deals um, to the, the, that Ian alluded to earlier as well that uh, slipped into the first half of 2019. But the underlying trend, as we can see there, is the, the, the general uh, fall of uh, the, the non-clarity revenues and the general improvement of clarity, uh, sorry, I referred to revenues there, of non-clarity uh, cash EBITDA, um, offset by the general improvement of clarity cash EBITDA, which is a trend we expect to continue. And we remain very confident in saying that clarity remains on track to be a cash profitable standalone business in its own right. Um, just a word on the cash position. Um, so the cash position at the end of the first half was 7.4 million. At the end of the previous first half, it was 8.4 million. Now, uh, that 7.4 million is slightly ahead of where we actually expected it to be at the end of the first half. Um, but the reason for the slight fall, and again, that's, that fall is completely uh, in line with expectations, um, is due to the fact that one of those large deals at the start of 2019, the one million pound per annum subscription deal, paid us uh, the first three years of their subscription license upfront. So uh, our working capital uh, position moved significantly at the end of the or during the first half of of uh, the prior period. Equally, uh, in that uh, first half of the, the prior period, we sold our, our VME business to, to Fujitsu. You'll, you'll remember for approximately three times um, their uh, uh, declining revenue stream, which we, we felt was uh, a, a very sensible thing to do at, at, the, at the time and still, uh, still stand by that decision. Uh, that, that clearly bolstered the cash position at the end of the, of the first half last year. Um, so you know, cash is exactly where we expect it to be, in fact, slightly ahead. And uh, you know, we, we have uh, no concerns whatsoever um, against the, uh, about the slight fall on the prior year, completely aligned with expectations. Um, Tom, I can just see a question coming in actually um, from Colin with regard to cash margins. Um, maybe, maybe just while we're on that slide, it's worth just saying a couple of words. Um, so, so what, you know, how, how do we expect that to play out over the next couple of years? Um, on the legacy business, I think it's fair to say, um, you know, that's relatively stable now, um, around that 30, 34 percent level. Um, and clearly on the on the clarity side, um, you know, as that business matures, that's where we expect to see some very substantial margins kick in. Um, and of course, that's entirely really where we see the operational gearing of the business really start to ramp up. So, um, you know, as clarity matures, we absolutely expect that to move into the 30s. Um, and, you know, that is um, you know, fairly typical of a mature enterprise software company um, that's been in business for, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, so I, I think we're on track to do that. And in the next couple of years, certainly, um, you know, we would expect uh, Clarity Cash, cash EBITDA to break through the, um, the uh, you know, the 0% um, level, which we've been working to for some time. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Uh, just just to move on to to look at our, the the quality of our, our earnings, and this really just demonstrates all the points that we've been making um, uh, making throughout this presentation. So first graph there, re really re really just showing the successful transition to being more of a of a hundred percent subscription style revenue business, uh, which which we've now now successfully successfully done. Um, uh, and, and equally, the, the bottom half of the uh, of the slide there is, is showing the, the the clarity cost base or coverage of the clarity cost base that is covered by clarity recurring revenues. Actually, both 
both in the preceding period. Actually, if we were to look at that on a forward-looking basis, those percentages would be higher. Um, and, and that trend will, will continue. And, and ultimately, you know, we, we will be in a position, as, as Ian says, is moving towards that you know, mature software model around 30% margins and, and our cost, having our cost space entirely covered by um, our, our annual recurring revenue and, and, and having no reliance whatsoever on, on the services business. Yeah, moving on. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So uh, maybe just a quick step back up and, and um, maybe I can pick off a couple more of the questions that have come through. Um, so a question from Jake really around um, sales cycle length. Um, typically for us, um, sales cycles are in the nine to 15 month period. Um, and you know, it very much depends on the nature of the, the proposition and in some cases, the segment um, that the client is in. So for example, on the buy side, um, we find that decision making uh, can be much faster uh, than working with a large global tier one sell side bank, for example. So the sell side deals typically can run up to 18 months, whereas a buy side deal you know, we've done those in, in fact, in some cases, a matter of um, four or five months. Um, I think there's another question which I'll, I'll also pick up on, on, on at this moment, which was, an, was a question from Colin, really around if we take a critical look at the business today, um, where, where do we see some of our greatest challenges? And, I, and in some ways, I think that has been highlighted by the, the chart that we showed about where we're investing our money. Um, you know, we still have a relatively small sales team um, and a relatively small partner channel playing in a very significant global market. Um, and so in terms of, you know, greatest challenges, you know, I'd say clearly we've, we've got more work to do to build awareness of the brand and we've got a lot more work to do to build partnerships, um, whether they be um, OEM relationships or relationships with big systems integrators, or of course with partners who can originate deals for us. Um, but, but that's the main area of focus and, and it continues of course to be the area that we're prioritizing uh, our investment into. Um, so if we just take a step back up now and look at um, in some ways, I guess you could regard this as the investment case, but it it does talk a little bit to the question of what's going on in the market, because the core of what we do is we work with financial institutions to put in place automation uh, and remove manual processes and enable them to be more efficient and effective as institutions. and the COVID um, crisis has really highlighted um, how far too much of core processing within financial institutions is dependent upon manual case workers and data workers. Um, so I genuinely believe that our opportunity um, has been highlighted over the last three months in, you know, to financial institutions in in perhaps a way that they haven't realized before. Uh, and when you think about large financial institutions that have you know, hundreds, if not thousands of individuals working in offshore centers, um, you know, that they've had to manage a transition to remote working. You know, it really highlights how um, technologies like ours can really make a difference. Um, so you've got a classic traffic light going on in their businesses. They want to move faster. They want to be more in innovative and agile, and yet they're being held back by proliferation of non-standard data in their business, highly complex businesses built up over generations through acquisitions, through um, acquiring siloed systems. And of course, they've got a fundamental problem structural problem with the profitability of many capital markets firms. And then in the middle there in amber, you've got this push-pull requirement of regulatory and compliance demands um, as they try to manage risk and improve their financial and operational controls. 
Um, and all of that is very much driving a need to be more connected, have more intelligent automation within their systems, have end-to-end -end and front-to-back processes, um, and have much more flexible and agile technologies. And all of that, of course, plays exactly to where we, we, we as a company have some uniques. Um, and I see a question from, uh, from Monica with regard to how our proposition differs from competitors. You know, the key for us is that we can ingest any format of data in batch or in real time. We can match it up and process it without requirement for the financial institutions to standardize that data, to, to normalize it. Uh, and we can serve it up uh, and identify where those quality issues are that are causing significant manual intervention to resolve and, and manage those exceptions. And some of those core uniques for us around using AI, for example, to match data or the ability to ingest any format of data, you know, we continue to have, um, you know, several years advantage over the competition. Um, so I think the strategic opportunity is very much there for us. Um, and if we, um, we move on to the next slide, um, you'll see that the progress that we've made in key accounts really highlights the opportunity. So this, this diagram shows, you know, if we go back to where we were in 2015, this is our recurring revenue, clarity recurring revenue for, you know, four major customers. You know, two of our early adopters back in 2015, you can see how their usage of the technology has grown. Um, you know, quadrupled in one case and doubled in another case. You can see how we've brought on new key accounts. Um, customer C, a couple of years ago, has very significantly grown. Um, and a more recent win, Customer D, we did some small level of business with a couple of years ago, and then we announced um, that they had signed with us um, as a new Tier 1 bank win in uh, June of this year, and you've seen a very significant step up. So the technology works. It's proven at massive scale. Once we win these major relationships, we can grow those relationships. Um, and the technology is incredibly sticky. So really what we're doing here is we're building a software business with very high levels of strong recurring revenue that will be, will be with us for a generation. Um, and it's really important, therefore, as we look on quarter on quarter, not to, do, not to get too phased by movements in the numbers because actually the single most important uh, KPI to be looking at is that forward-looking clarity recurring revenue. Um, and as Tom's explained, the forward-looking recurring revenue is very different to what we may book in any half year on half year. Okay, and there are good reasons for that. Um, so if we, if we again move on and look at the strategic opportunity, and I think where we've got to um, it, on the clarity journey, um, we still have a very substantial opportunity ahead of us. Um, you know, if we, if we look at the entirety of global spend on financial technology, we are in a niche, uh, and I've used those very words in our um, half-year report, and I, I see there's a question from Steve around why we've described it as a niche. Um, you know, the niche happens to be 300, uh, 350 to 500 million, but, but actually in terms of the uh, you know, 100 billion spent on financial technology, it is a niche. Um, but, but of course, we're growing rapidly within that niche. Uh, and it's our um, expectation and aspiration to be the dominant player within that niche. Um, the work we've done to gain now, you know, 60 plus new name wins over the last few years, the majority done the last five to six years, plus um, the acquired customers that have come into the group. Um, we've now got about 100 customers within the Clarity business. 
Um, and of course, we're adding to that, you know, as we go forward. Um, and those customers are in the large part, you know, well-known, well-funded, global, blue chip financial institutions or large corporates that we have got, you know, um, very strong, long-standing relationships with. Um, and whilst we may see the occasional dropout, actually in COVID, it's been encouraging that in the last six months, um, our you know, cancellation rate has been, in fact, 0.2% of our clarity recurring revenue over the last six months. So, so actually virtually zero cancellations. So we, you know, we've targeting a very robust um, uh, client base in the market. The, the business itself, of course, the investment that with your support we've made in the technology now is rich with highly innovative and disruptive IP. Um, and we offer an incredible service to customers. In fact, those customers operating with us in the cloud have seen 100% uptime since we launched Clarity as a service. So again, you know, very, very pleased with that. And so I think they're excellent foundations for us. Um, if I can, I'll drop to a few more questions at this point. Um, uh, Raghavan's asked a question specifically around how we can increase scale and um, and whether actually, you know, combining our business with others makes sense. Um, and, and I think what I'd say to that is, you know, we have done a couple of bolt-on acquisitions in the last few years. Um, and we'll continue to look for those where they make good sense. Um, and I think I'll talk specifically on, um, on B2 because I see a question around that or a point around that. Um, you know, B, B2, we, we, we believe was a really good strategic acquisition. It's been unfortunate that one of their key customers that Tom referred to, um, a Luxembourg bank and a subsidiary of a Scandinavian company, Unfortunately, they closed that business. Um, and as a result, um, a key customer for B2 pre-acquisition um, terminated their license. That was extremely unfortunate, but we have replaced that with new business. Um, and strategically, that acquisition for us um, has proved very valuable because the key technology that we acquired with B2 is the technology that enables us to connect or corporates to connect with multiple banks. And we've got now something like 300 banks connected into that Clarity multi-bank service. And it's those underpinnings that we will use as we roll out the assets that we're building with ANZ. So strategically, it's actually been a really important deal for us. So to the question around acquisitions, they continue to be important for us, but not at, not at the expense of driving organic um, growth. Um, so I think I've covered a lot of the questions. Tom, if you wouldn't mind just scrolling through and let's just see if there's a few more that we can pick up on. Um, and while we're doing that, let me just pick up on um, a couple of points around, uh, you know, how we see the the second half of, of 2020 looking. Um, so key challenges for us, if you can go to the, the next slide, key challenges for us in the second half. Um, looking at the pipeline today, um, we've obviously in the last month or so as institutions have come out of their very internally focused Q2 while they were looking at um, you know, really their own COVID uh, crisis management plans. Um, we, we've been working with customers and prospects to re-qualify our pipeline at, against their projects. And there's no doubt we've seen some slippage and I think it would be unrealistic to expect anything different. Um, but we do have in our pipeline some good opportunities for the second half. Um, and actually, very encouragingly, we're seeing, particularly over the last month, um, our pipeline starts to build um, as prospects come back to market to start to work with, you know, vendors like us on new projects, and particularly around, as I said, intelligent automation 
in their back offices where you know the COVID crisis has really highlighted their deficiencies. Um, so you know we'd expect to see some new wins. We'd expect to see continued growth within our existing installed base, um, and we do have some new opportunities that we'd expect to see within cash management. Um, we also remain very positive about the regulatory sales opportunity. And part of the reason why we feel this is important is it's a really good use case for our technology. Um, you know, the technology is really good at ingesting data, looking for problems in that data and managing the exceptions. And if you think about trade and transaction reporting within regulatory space, um, institutions cannot afford to get their regulatory reporting wrong. Um, they get picked up by the regulators at increasing um, uh, levels of severity around that. So we see regulatory opportunities as being key to our future as well. Um, we've also got some exciting plans on the digital side um, as well. So lots to do on sales and marketing, um, lots to do on project delivery. Um, and we'll keep the investment going in, um, in R&D as we complete some of our work uh, from a product development perspective. Thank, thank you, Ian. Um, I'm just obviously mindful of, uh, of, of your time. And obviously, I know that you're very keen for investors to give you feedback post this meeting. Um, Obviously, you've obviously addressed some of the questions throughout the uh, presentation. And, and whilst I'm here, I'd like to remind investors that uh, a copy of this recording of this presentation, along with the slides and the published Q&A, uh, will be available on your dashboard. Um, guys, I don't know if you want to pick out, perhaps, if there's any more questions um, that we have time to answer. Or alternatively, of course, we can view them post the meeting. And as I say, we'll publish those back to investors uh, when that's been completed. Um, I think we've actually answered a lot of the questions. There's one or two we would like to come back on in written form. Perfect. Um, but, but apart from that, Mark, I think j just if I may, I'll just summarise by saying um, it's really important to um, read into the half-year report and understand some of the key points we've made. Um, based upon what we've already signed year-to-date, um, plus what is highly visible in our um, legacy business or recurring revenue business, we've already got very close to 90% of our original group revenue numbers covered. And actually, without any new more business, we're completely comfortable in our full year earnings. So the most important thing for us to be doing over the next six months is adding to our Clarity recurring revenue base. Um, and that'll give us a really strong um, footprint into 2021. So I'll, I'll wrap up on that point, Mark, and you know, really appreciate everyone's support. Thank yeah. you for joining the call. No problem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Tom uh, and, and Ian, for updating investors today as part of your roadshow, I guess, given the uh, um, issues around COVID. Um, thank you very much for giving them the, the update today. Could I ask investors please not to close this session as you'll be automatically re redirected to provide the company with your feedback. That's really important. Um, if you access this meeting via our website, the feedback will appear in front of you. If you accessed it from the link in the email, uh, we just ask you please to log back in and provide the company with your feedback. Uh, once again, on behalf of Gresham Technologies, um, uh, Ian and Tom and Investment Company, thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Thank you.